My next guest on Tea Time with me, Ali Monjak, is entrepreneur and well-known philanthropist Sir John Medeski, saviour of Reading Football Club in the 90s. He shares his views on the economy and working through a global pandemic. I was invited into his country home at Hep Park, so let's find out more. Welcome to Tea Time with me, Ali Monjak. How Hello. are you today? It's a great pleasure to be here, Ali, and um, I, wish, I, I wish Tea Time with Ali all the success in the world, so I do. Brilliant. So, I mean, you, thank you for inviting me into your home. My pleasure. So, and, and what a lovely house it is. You actually built it yourself, not physically, did well, you? Well, not with these hands, no, but I did, um, I mean, obviously I had very good uh, architects and builders and so on. And um, it, is a, it is a beautifully built home. I don't mean to brag, but it really is. And uh, um, it's, it's state of the art. I mean, every conceivable um, innovation was achieved and all the finest uh, wood and um, nothing, nothing was left um, unturned to create something of complete and total excellence. Um, which is what you do best, isn't it, John? Well, one likes to do one's best. I mean, I always, from a very early age, I've always believed in the pursuit of excellence, and I think it's a great mantra to have and something to you know, spur one on to do always better if one can. So when was it you developed this great determination to do well in life? Well, probably from a very young age, actually, because um, I didn't have the most illustrious upbringing. And I think, you know, you either crumble or you, you make something of yourself. And hopefully I did make something of myself. So I think uh, that's it. And I, I think, you know, when we're going through these ghastly times at the moment, it's up to people to to just get on with it. I think there's far too much people self-analysing themselves and, you know, everybody thinking, a lot of them have, but a lot of them have not got mental problems and so on. We just have to get on with life. I mean, I, I'm fortunate enough to live a very long time and seen good times and bad times, and uh, one just has to get on with it. One really does, you know, and I think it's so easy just to sort of... Uh, you know, sort of succumb to pressures that perhaps are there but not there as much as probably one thinks they are so I do believe that people have got to have a lot of self self control and, and, and determination self determination especially in these very hard times I mean in 2008 you actually said didn't you that there was going to be well in I think before that you actually said that there was going to be a recession and yeah. at yeah. the time everybody was like, well, what, what, what do you mean? This is not going to happen. Yeah. And of course it did. I it's mean, 2007, in fact. But yes, you're absolutely right. Well, I could see the writing on the wall. And I think, um, you, you know, I mean, this, what has happened now is completely and totally different. This is a ghastly situation we find ourselves in through this revolting and hideous virus that um, is very contagious and um, it's but it's almost as bad as a, a third world war without any bullets flying around because the devastating impact it's had globally it's it just unbelievable and in, in my humble opinion the Chinese have got an awful lot to answer for quite frankly in terms of not using enough husbandry in terms of their um, establishments for making chemical warfare, etc., etc., etc. In in uh, what's the name of the place? Ho um, Wuhan. Wuhan, yeah, Wuhan, yeah. So yes, so it, you know, it's just you know we make it up as we go along, and people point the finger here, there, and everywhere. But quite frankly, it's a bit disingenuous because nobody knew the extent of it, and at least. Um, Powers B did get on and build a, the Nightingale Hospital and other facilities because, quite frankly, they didn't know how bad this epidemic was going to be. And uh, it was pretty bad, but it, quite, it wasn't cataclysmic like it 
could have been, although having said that, over 50,000 people lost their lives due to it, which is, which is terrible for those victims and the, and the families of those victims and friends and so on. I think we all know somebody, or several people as I do, that have been succumbed to this revolting disease. But, you know, the thing is now, when it's sort of subdued somewhat and we seem to be far more in control of it, then it means to say that we should really be returning to normal or trying some form of normality. In my humble opinion, I don't think um, the British nation has been so healthy as it is as I speak, because A, they're washing their hands every five minutes, they're to a large extent doing social distancing and all the rest of it. People are far more fastidious uh, and a lot more a lot cleaner than they've ever been. So, by virtue of that, we shouldn't really, in my humble opinion, get a great big outbreak of uh, flu this year because people are far more fastidious. And if they are, then that, that reflects in, in the numbers getting flu and so on and so forth. So, I think the nation, by and large, is going to be far healthier. Yes, I mean, you, you're probably right. I mean, you know, I mean, do you see, though... You really I mean, think I'm probably right? I'm no, no, you, you are right. OK, fine, it, yeah, it, <laughs> It's true, you are right. I mean, people are thinking about personal hygiene a lot more than they ever have done before. But, I mean, in terms of, you know, economic recovery, what are your thoughts on it? Well, it is a sort of form of Armageddon in terms of the economic recovery because so many businesses are flat, flat lining. And of course, uh, you know, the government are borrowing horrendous sums of money. And, you know, make no mistake, when the government dishes out, you know, vast sums of money for furlough and now they're going to give people money if they caught the virus and the people that have got to self-isolate in, in places that are, are very... Um, contagious you know this money's got to be paid back and there's only some there's only one line of uh, money they can get and that's taxation so watch out you know the, 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 those that are lucky enough to be employed and have jobs and so on and so forth are going to be taxed more it stands to reason what do you think about the brexit situation now because i mean that is due to happen in January, a year later on from when the, you know we said that we'd exit. I mean, do you think that that is a good idea or a bad idea in terms of the economy now? And, you know, do, do we not need to be with our European partners or how's this going to work? Well, I feel enormously sorry for the Conservative government and Boris Johnson in particular who succumbed to the the ghastly virus and he was laid low for some considerable time having said that he's recovered incredibly well and he's getting far more back to his old self day by day which is great because he's a charismatic leader and that's exactly what we need in these hard times going back to your point about brexit i think that brexit i voted for brexit i believe in brexit and brexit will happen and I'm pleased about that too, because the inter alia debt in Europe is unbelievably high. And we've never really sat well in a federal Europe, because we're an independent nation and always have been. In 1066, when Magna Carta was signed, it was... Sorry, was that 1066? Or was that Battle of Hastings? No, that's Magna Carta. Oh, no, that's Battle of Hastings. Yeah, sorry, I got that wrong, did I? In 1215, when Magna Carta was signed, yeah. and all the knights forced King John to sign Magna Carta, the, a set of rules were set out for the behaviour of this country. And do you know what? It's become part of our psyche as a nation. What's left of our nation, I hasten to add. But it has become part of our psyche. And people revere that, you know, that that's why people like to come to this country is because they see it as a fair country by and large. And, but we do honour agreements, international agreements by and large. Um, I don't think Europe is cut from the same cloth.
for instance, they will sign the agreement and say, well, how do we get around this? Whereas we sign the agreement and say, right, those are what, that's what we've got to do and that's what we do. So that's a fundamental difference to some of our counterparts in Europe. And I think because of that, it, 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 it keeps us apart. As I say, we're not used to being a federal, part of a federal Europe. We're an independent country and long may that last. Hmm. So, I mean, you know, it, the, the, the business world still goes on and, you know, very much for years and years and years, we, we have been an ally with America, with the States. But, I mean, do you think that that, that is really good economically at the moment? Do they really have control of the virus out there? Well, going back to our allies, I mean, our oldest ally, I believe, in the world is Portugal. They're our oldest ally, and it's been going on for hundreds of years, and um, that's rather sweet and nice. However, the new world, America, we need America, <coughs> and we need to belong, you either belong to the East or the West, in my opinion, and I think it's right to belong to the West. Um, but the world is changing, you know, the, the, the complexion of the world and the, is changing radically. Um, America is such a vast country with vast resource and so on and so forth. I mean, the impact of coronavirus keeps running its ugly head everywhere. I mean, you talk about America, I think you'll find that India is having an equal problem in terms of, you know, the spread of the disease and so on. And we've seen it's now reared its head, ugly head in Hong Kong and they're talking now of a, uh, it's 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 uh, it's um, you know the 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 virus is um, what they call it you know um, changing uh, mutating mutating that's right the virus is mutating so you know heaven knows what we're dealing with it you know it could be a, the same sort of thing next year but a different strain and you know the. Boffins are still scratching their heads and so on. We've promised them, well, they might find a cure, they might not a vaccination for it. It's just, it's just a moving feast and that's what's so scary about it. It's, like I said, it's very much akin to a world war in terms of the fact there's no beginning and you don't know what the end is yet. Could get worse, could get better, we just don't know. And that is the scary thing about it and that's why it's very difficult for any uh, kind of company, and indeed, um, even dare I say it, sort of uh, um, associations with other countries and so on, simply because we don't know how this is going to pan out. I mean, we've seen, you know, the knee jerk. Well, it's not knee jerk. It's, it's, it's because knees must when the devil drives. We've had these associations with other countries, like for instance, pulling the court, Port Calais down on Spain and indeed France, because, you know, they're getting a second wave of the virus and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's really playing havoc with every conceivable thing. And we've seen the, the absolute dire consequences of um, the travel industry, hospitality, and so it goes on. So it, it, is, it is so difficult to anticipate, you know, the, 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 the end game, because one can't, because it's just still going on. But there are still companies that are making a lot of money out there, aren't they? That even have thrived through well, indeed, the coronavirus. I mean, you've got the likes of uh, um, you've got the likes of Amazon, which I don't subscribe to simply because they've caused so much uh, havoc in you know perfectly normal businesses, and they've just sort of pulled the rug from under their feet. I know it's called in the name of progress and so on, and I suppose you can argue either, any which way you want to. I mean. You can say that, you know, these great big Ocado vans going down the road and Tesco's delivery and all the rest of it is good stuff. But quite frankly, on the road today, all you see is these vans delivering stuff. And you go to somewhere like Amazon and you order a, a little tiny piece of equipment like that and it comes in a whacking great big box. I don't know quite what that's going to do for the environment, but there you go. And uh, indeed, you know, it's just... You know, it is the way of the world, it's the way of shape of things to come, but um, being Luddite and reasonably old-fashioned, I suppose, and quite old, 
I, I love browsing. I like going and seeing what I'm buying, touchy feely, blah blah blah. Whereas online, you know, it's it's a leap of a leap of faith. And yes, you can send it back. I mean, there you go. What does that do for the footprint? You know, these especially women that buy loads of dresses and then send them all back again. I think it's hysterical, <laughs> but that's another matter. But by and large, it has affected. It. There are some businesses that are really doing well out of it, and you know, Amazon is. A very good example. That's probably the one that's uh, probably done better than anybody else. Quite frankly, I mean, who had ever thought they were doing incredibly well before this, and now they're doing even a lot better. Uh, which to me is uh, the sadness, but that's personal. Not, not. It's not, not any. I mean, you know, Bezos, best luck to him. Which I thought the idea, joking, but um, but you know what I mean. It's it is um, it is. Uh, you know, it's all embracing and just sort of basically stuffs every business in the high street, you know. Yeah, I mean, you have been a, a huge philanthropist, haven't you, throughout your entire business career. You've always given to charities and given to people and thought about, I mean, you know, Reading potentially wouldn't be the place it is today if it wasn't for you. Well, that's very generous to say that, but I think what you're referring to is us sort of well, building for, to build the new Medeski Stadium and getting Reading Football Club into the Premiership twice, which actually put Reading on the map, there's no doubt about that. I mean, the um, powers of be talk about making Reading into a city, but quite frankly, Reading in the Premiership is far more penetrating than making Reading a city. But, you know, I mean, yes, well, thank you for that compliment, I accept it. Graciously. Yeah, so um, Nigel Howe actually is, is no longer CEO, is he? He's, he's now stepped down is, and is just vice president. Well, um, yes, that's true. Um, uh, his talents will be used in terms of building the new training ground and then developing Hogwood, the old training ground, which they probably turn into housing, I don't know. So his hands will be very, very, he comes from a property background, so I suppose it makes quite a lot of sense. But he will be missed as the chief executive. But, you know, the, the, the club belongs to Mr. Dye, and Mr. Dye can do what he wants. You know, it's his club, so, you know, that's what they've decided, so. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, you know, obviously Nigel Howe was first in your employment at Reading FC, wasn't he? Yeah, I did hire Nigel, yes, absolutely. And um, I think it was a very good appointment. And uh, in fact, not just Nigel, I mean, they had some, still, they're still there, quite a lot of the people that I took on. And uh, they're, 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 they're the backbone of Reading Football Club. I mean, managers come and go, players come and go, but the back. The backbone of Reading Football Club is the staff that have been there for years, you know. We've got some amazing people there. I mean, Sue Hewitt, the club secretary, she does an absolutely incredible job, you know. She, I would personally say she's probably the best um, club secretary in the country. And uh, I don't say that lightly either. We've got Ray Booth, who's been there forever. He looks after the, 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 the stadium and so on, Brian Stabler. Um, tearing his hair out, he's the number cruncher, the you know accountant, and he's been there for a long, long time, and he's doing a great job under these very, very difficult circumstances. You've got Jackie Evans; she's been there forever. She she does uh, HR and uh, quite a few other jobs and so on. But those key people have been there since I've been there, or not since I've been there, they, they came during my tenure. Hmm. And um, so I'm very proud of all of them and they've done a fantastic job for Reading Football Club. And uh, all I can say is that um, I have nothing to do with Reading Football Club any longer. I haven't been for some time now, but I wish Reading Football Club and the owners every success going forward. I really do. Yeah, I mean, do, how do you see, I mean, obviously, everything has been affected and they've not been able to have, you know, their usual fans and crowds to the stadium. I mean, not just Reading, stadiums across across mm. the UK and, and beyond. 
I mean, how do you see, you know, football as a lucrative business anymore? Is, well, I think, <laughs> is it a lucrative um, business? I think it's a bit facile saying a lucrative business. I don't believe it's ever been a lucrative business, certainly since I've been involved. Uh, I mean, there's very, very few clubs that can actually turn a profit. You know, it's, it's always a pretty good, gratuitous sort of thing to be doing. And I mean, you'll have noticed that most of the clubs are now owned by mega wealthy people. You know, I often dine out on what I say, and I say Reading Football Club. People say to me, is Reading Football Club for sale, this is when I owned it, and I say, I've owned Reading Football Club six years, ten years, fourteen years, however long I was involved. And I say, Reading Football Club, been, I've been chairman for six years, and um, Reading Football Club's always been for sale, and it still is today. However, millionaires need not apply, only billionaires, because it is the foible of the super rich, and I predicted years ago that most of the big clubs would be foreign-owned, and hey-ho, most of the big clubs are foreign-owned. It's not difficult to work out. I mean, it's a foible for the super-rich. I'm pleased to say that our, 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 our owner now is allegedly worth about two billion, I think it is. don't know what that is. Probably dollars. Not sure, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it becomes silly money, doesn't it? I mean, they're well, still it's, it's, gladiators, aren't they? But, what you, do you know, mean, the, the footballers are still gladiators. Well, but they're, 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 they're um, I wouldn't call them gladiators, but I think, I, I don't know if this is what you mean, but what you're saying is they're, they're paid mercenaries and they go from one club to another with alacrity. And, um, and, the deeper your pockets, the better players you can get. Although there is this called, there is this device now called fair play, where they try and make sure, which has been thrown into complete confusion because nobody goes to football anymore because they can't. And part of the thing was you couldn't spend more than you were earning. Well, nobody's earning anything as we speak because you can't. Well, they are. You get the television money, but you can't get the resource for, for um, you know, uh, bums on seats. Yeah, that's that's vanished, and so is the hospitality, etc., etc. I'm just absolutely thank my lucky stars that I'm not in the hot seat. Don't know if I could have coped, you know, with this catastrophe. It's just as well we've got this enormously wealthy gentleman to be the owner. Yeah. Because there's very few people that could sustain the losses that are going that are happening as I speak, and. Obviously, there's grave concern about a lot of football clubs if they will survive this if this debacle. It really is, you know. And, uh, you know, as I say, as we've both said, the world's a different place now. Well, no, it is a different place. And I, I also think that because of the pandemic, we've kind of put different values on things, you know, like nurses and NHS people and people that are actually being out on the front line caring. Um, I, think, I think that's a broad brushstroke, if I might say so. I think there's a heck of a lot of worthy people out there that have been absolutely stoic throughout this. And um, I would say the front line NHS workers are the, the, the heroes, the people that have had to carry on as normal during this time because we still need we need water we need food we need you know certain uh, certain you know we do need doctors and so on and so forth emergency workers the police of course who have a very difficult job and of course teachers who've been teaching some of the key workers children while this this has been going on so there's an awful lot of heroes out there that certainly deserve recognition as well as the NHS key workers. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, at the moment, a lot of nurses are asking for a 15% pay rise. I mean, what, 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 what's your take on that? Well, I wasn't aware of that, to be quite frank, but I mean, I think, you know, so many worthy cases, but um, all I can say is the fact that... Um, 
I think a lot of people should be very grateful they've actually got a job to go to because there's going to be so many people that won't be having a job. And, and you, you, you know, I mean, it's really sad, you know, and I, 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 I really can't say anything about that because I think that, you know, in an ideal world, everybody get everything they wanted, but the, the country's on its knees economically. Um, obviously, they will put up taxes and so on. I mean, nothing comes for free, as I've also, as I've already mentioned, and and the cost of our country of this epidemic is still unknown, and and we still don't know because it's not over. So it is very frightening, and I just hope and pray that we can bounce back as a nation, but it does need people to be positive about going forward, and we must try and arrest this this ghastly disease but the trouble is though that it, it is mutating as I understand it and you know every few years we get a new kind of threat from some kind of virus and when you consider they can't even cure the common cold it doesn't look very bright the future I mean I don't know, it's, it's, it, but I just feel that you know, mankind is resilient and does come back and does survive and does do his best. And I think we've just got to encourage everybody to do their best now. I'm delighted that the schools are opening up because I feel so sorry for young people. They're having their lives plucked away from them. You know, just an informative time. I mean, it's so darn sad to see that. And my heart goes out to them and, you know, we all know that the criminality is rearing its ugly head in all these different places due to the fact that mm. these kids are just darn bored. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great to give them something that they can actually do to achieve and, 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 and do well for themselves because at the end of the day, it's all about education. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, that that is one of your... I mean, obviously, we've spoken over the years since I've known you. And, you know, one of the things that you've always said repeatedly that you're most proud of, even out of the goodness knows how many businesses you've owned, is the John Modeski Academy. Well, yes. I mean, it's changing lives for the better, as far as I'm concerned, and that's a good thing. And <clears throat> as I've said many times in the past, if I'd gone there, I might have learnt something. <laughs> I think you're okay. <laughs> I think you've done all right. <laughs> so, I mean, you basically have achieved through and been recognised through the university anyway. I mean, you were um, Chancellor of Reading University for, for quite a few years, weren't you? Indeed, yeah, which, which was a great honour, I can tell you. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and um, again, it's a, a very revered university, a leading opponent of climate change throughout the world, agriculture, the great big farm. They've got so many different faculties and they're all amazing and it's just a very, very good university and we're so lucky to have it in Reading. But, um, you know, during my tenure I was very, there's always been, you know, the town of Reading and the University of Reading and I was always trying to get town and gown together during my tenure as Chancellor and I think so David Bell, who was the vice chancellor at the time, had the same notion. So we both worked reasonably hard at trying to achieve that. And it's so exciting now because we've got the the new University of Reading Business Park, you know, that's emerging, which is terribly exciting. And there's some fantastic companies already there. So yeah, Reading, uh, you know, the University of Reading is is a very inspirational place and. Quite frankly, there's so many different aspects of it that are taking place. It, it really is quite stunning. And um, you know, I urge people to find out more about it because, it, 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 you know, cybernetics and all sorts go on at the University of Reading. It, it really is. I mean, as Chancellor, when I was Chancellor, I, I mean, every time I went there, I was confounded by how some amazing piece of learning that was going on and so on and so forth, or research, or you know, some course, or whatever, whatever. It, it, it really is an amazing, amazing institution. 
And of course it is now one of the, the leading universities to do with the, the study of climate change. You know, Reading should be very proud of that university and and I urge you know, a lot of the people in Reading to try and get a place there because uh, you know, it really is worthwhile. Lovely. Well, look, thank you for coming on Tea Time with me, Ali Monjak. It, it's been fun to catch up. Lunchtime, lunchtime, <laughs> didn't it? No, Lunch, right. Lunchtime. Yeah. So, um, and yeah, so the best of luck. You're still in business. Do you think you'll ever retire? Um, well, I mean, it's a nice idea, but I think, um, you know, compared to a few years ago, uh, um, I'm pleased to say I'm not in business quite so much. It's quite fascinating, actually. When I turned the age, certain age, I suddenly had all these companies. I mean, they weren't terribly good, but I had so many companies, and and I just thought, what's this all about? So I, I, I've actually reduced them no end now. So I've only got a few that I like left, and that's made me a lot happier. And um, so I am getting a bit more, as the Americans call, leisure time, which is which suits me, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And I've got a lovely granddaughter now that I absolutely adore.